be more of a Greek set of armor than it is a Roman set of armor. You're 100% right, but Amazon Prime did not sell a Greek or a Roman set of armor, and this was substantially cheaper. So it helps us get the illustration across of uh, this armor that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus about. Uh, if you have your Bible, through Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read that in just a moment, but I want to take a moment here before we dive into the scriptures to just celebrate all the good things that God is doing in our church. It's been a, been a whirlwind of the last couple of weeks. As, uh, as Courtney mentioned, we had a team of eight, eight of us from the church down in the Dominican Republic. A great trip. Uh, thank you for your giving. Uh, every time we go, there's a project, and we dug a fish pond this year. In the first couple of days, we dug with our hands, and then day three, the machine showed up, so it made all of our work feel worthless. But it was good for us. We got a good workout. Dig in those first couple of days, and it's going to be awesome. There's going to be a group of 15 families that are going to be part of a co-op. They're going to manage and steward the resources of that fish pond. And they'll be able to feed their families from the tilapia that's grown there, but also take it to market and sell it and provide income for their families. And there's no way they could have ever done that without you, church, and your giving. Uh, Today, this morning, we have a team of 30-plus people on their plane. They're boarding an airplane right now in the next few minutes to go to Mexico to go spend Thanksgiving. Uh, There's just no better way to spend Thanksgiving than serving people, building a home in Ensenada, Mexico for people who can never afford it. A few years ago, our family got to go on that trip, and it was probably one of our most memorable Thanksgivings for sure. And then part of this DR trip is uh, I got the opportunity to bring my daughter. I think we have a picture there. That's the whole team. We're visiting someone's house, praying for them. And then next picture is me and Jane. Jane is our youngest daughter. And what's been amazing is this trip we just took is our 13th trip that we've taken as a church over the last seven years. And when you show up 13 times in a row to a community, they know you. And we become friends and we become family. And uh, Anna and I have been very intentional to create a culture in our home where each of our kids, We've invested and saved and been diligent so that they can go on this trip with us when they're in middle school. And uh, one person was asking me, like, why would you take your kids on a missions trip like that? Aren't you afraid they're going to die and stuff? I was like, no. It's actually a really strategic thing. We've created a culture in our home. And I never thought about it this way, but somebody was asking me, I said, this might be the best parenting advice. Invest $2,000 in your kid to take them on a trip around the world to see that living in America is a great privilege. And I guarantee you, you will save tens of thousands of dollars in buying designer sneakers for them. It's amazing what happens when you reorient your kids' life to realize that those things that maybe we feel so much pressure from school and culture are not that important. And and it was interesting, some of our staff, uh, people who helped with our youth were asking me, Tim, how come your kids aren't super worried about like what styles and brands they wear? I said, well, one, dad doesn't give them a good example. But the second thing (laughs) is it's just not the culture of our home. We've just decided to live differently, and it's just been the culture and the water in which they've breathed. And I'm so excited as they get launched out into their lives that they would continue that, that the mission of God is about serving and loving, not about having the right threads, um, that we can live that way. Well, oh, and then one other thing I wanted to celebrate. Friday morning, uh, Anna and I and a group of about 40 people from our church got to be down at the Snohomish County Courthouse. Most of the time when I go to the courthouse, I get to visit people in prison, so it's not really awesome. Uh, but every once in a while, we get to go down there, and we got to celebrate the adoption of three kids into a family in our church. Uh, Sid and Ginger Evaneta, they were here last service. They adopted three siblings out of the foster care system, and this is their fourth child. Their, uh, their daughter, Nicole, now is, uh, she's in eighth grade, and she got to be back in the room with the same judge that facilitated her adoption as they adopted three more beautiful kids. Their two older uh, adult grown children were in the room, and there were 40 of us, and there wasn't a dry eye in the room. And I'm just telling you, the kingdom of God was present in Snohomish County Courthouse. Uh, I think it was room three. Man, it was just great things going on, and I'm just excited to see what God's doing in us and through us and among us. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul's writing, Paul the great apostle, who is known as the apostle who, the reason we're here, the reason there's a church in Stanford, Washington, so far from Jerusalem where a man named Jesus went to a cross and died and three days later rose again. The reason that there's a church on the other side of the world is because men like Paul who heard God's call and left everything they knew and went and shared the gospel with people all around the world. And that message made it to the town of Ephesus. And Ephesus was a cultural hub, a religious hub, and an economic hub in the Roman Empire. 
And this place was a wild place. When you think of ancient worlds, I think we often tend to think of conservative and everything was kind of together. Ephesus was was like highly secularized, like amoral. It was a wild place. There were not Judeo-Christian ethics in Ephesus. And that's the place where the gospel begins to flourish. And the church grows in the midst of moral and social chaos, in the midst of the Roman Empire. And Paul's writing to these people. He's saying, hey, you are doing well. You are loving each other. You're serving each other. You're reaching your neighbors and friends with the gospel of Jesus. But as he's concluding this letter, he says, hey, I want you guys to remember that you're in a battle. And he writes to them in Ephesians chapter 6, verse uh, 14, he says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And over these last few weeks, we've looked at each one of these pieces of armor and what that means for us. And with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Emily came back and gave a great message about the peace, that we're called to be people of peace. Jonathan talked about the, the shield of faith, that that's not just a passive weapon, but it's meant to be active in moving forward in our faith. And then this week, take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we'll end next week with the sword of the Spirit. But today we're going to talk about helmets. And the great thing is helmets are in the Bible. And it is a big topic in our world today. Anybody turn on ESPN or sports in the last week and there's all these fines. One guy ripped the dude's helmet off and tried to use that helmet as a weapon. I think we have a picture of, of what helmets do, football helmets. Anybody heard about concussions nowadays, but hitting with the crown of the helmet? We are very aware of helmets. It's a part of our dialogue. It's a part of our culture today. Is this, should young men be playing this sport? Is it safe for them? What's the, how do we make this happen? And it's a real dialogue we're having. And these helmets are designed to keep us safe. But you know, if you strap a helmet on and you go running into a still pull, it's not actually going to help you that much. It can still rattle your brain. We also see helmets in like motorcycles. Anybody ever ridden a motorcycle? And some states have helmet laws where you got to wear a helmet. Have you ever, I, I drive over to Montana a couple of times a year. And you should see right at the pass where you get into Montana, Montana, there's not a helmet law. And I'll see all the bikers pull over and take their helmet off and be like, freedom! <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, when your brain hits the pavement, apparently no one will be able to contain it. That's kind of the, the freedom of no helmets. But if you're a motorcycle rider, you realize that, that not only does it offer safety, but it's part of aerodynamics. You can move faster through uh, the air with a helmet on because these ears are just like wings that just slow you down. Uh, and then a modern soldier's helmet. This is kind of like a modern version of what Paul's talking about. This this helmet of a modern soldier is a sophisticated piece of technology. It has radios and communication so the soldier can get orders, know where they're at in the battlefield. There's, there's beacons and indicators that, that uh, they can use to identify. These are friendly soldiers. Don't fire on these. Uh, on, a, on a modern soldier's helmet is their, their name and their blood type. So if they're ever wounded on the battlefield, they can quickly provide medical attention to help them. There's a, there's a mount on the front that you can put night vision and, and all these amazing accessories which help the soldier be efficient and effective in the task in which they have. And then there's a protective element. It's supposed to help them in an explosion. It keeps their brain safe. It also can be bulletproof and avoid shrapnel and bullets from penetrating because we all know our heads are pretty important. What's between our mellow, or what's between our ears matters. And if you're taking notes, follow along in the app. Here's the first thing I want us to grab, is this, that in God's kingdom, there's a helmet law. In God's kingdom, there's a helmet law. Paul talks about it. He says, we need to put on the helmet of salvation. And salvation is this huge fundamental understanding of what it means to be a disciple. That Jesus, on the cross, died in our place for our sins and rose again three days later and give, gave us the gift of salvation. And this salvation is something that we're supposed to put on our heads, we're supposed to wear as we go into battle and face the challenges and difficulties of life. 
Paul not only was the first one to talk about this, he's, he's referring back to even the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. So there was even a helmet law in the Old Testament. There was a helmet law in modern uh, first century Rome, and there's a helmet law for us today as followers of Jesus. Isaiah 59, 17 says this, He put on righteousness as his best breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. And church... We need to put on the protection in the world that we face. We need to put on the helmet of salvation because being a Jesus follower is a contact sport. God is calling us to action. And I think this piece of armor, and even more than all the others, they're all important. But this one, the helmet of salvation, so much guards our thoughts. And our thoughts, the way God created us, is such a powerful and huge part of our life. And it's important that we put on the helmet of salvation. When I was a young boy, I grew up in the uh, country of Colorado. And we had a, a dirt road, grew up on dirt roads. And many of my other peers grew up on skateboards. And I didn't even know what a skateboard was because we lived in a dirt road. And skateboards don't work on dirt roads. But we had BMX bikes. Anybody else have a BMX bike? And do you remember, man, you'd build these jumps. And you thought that at least you were getting 35 feet of air, and it maybe been 35 inches. But man, there's just something about, remember being a kid on your bike, and you're jumping through the air, and you're thinking like, I am uh, Evil Knievel right now in this body, jumping over 35 matchbox trucks, like right? whatever it would be. We had this hill in front of our house, it was this dirt road, and it felt like this massive hill. We'd ride up it, step, you know, one-geared bikes, climb as hard as we could, and we'd get to the top, and we'd play the Rome, uh, Rambo, or not Rambo, but the Rocky song in my brain, I the a tiger, be singing it, and start heading down this road as fast as I could, and we had built a, on the ditch, we had dug it out, and then we built this jump, cruise down, and boom, and hit it, and feel like we're flying through the air, I'm invincible, so great, so amazing, a couple years ago, I took Anna, and I drove by the home I grew up in, and she's like, this is the hill you tell me all those stories about? <laughs> It's like it, it felt so big as a kid, and it's like a little rise. But, uh, but right, we tend to make things these really big. And you know the crazy part? I did all those jumps, and, and well, boy, I thought I was living on the edge. And you guess, guess what? I, I never wore a helmet. It wasn't even a thing. It wasn't part of the culture. It wasn't part of the world I lived in. You, you know, even when I was born, my mom told me that she brought me home in a, uh, from the hospital in a laundry basket between her feet. There weren't even car seats. And I'm not that old. Like, our, our culture has changed so much about safety and importance. And, and I, I grew up riding my bike and didn't ever wear a helmet. But in college, I really got into mountain biking. I had some friends who were mountain bikers, and I saved up my money and bought my first mountain bike. And what you do when you mountain bike is you put on a helmet. It was just part of the culture. It was what we were supposed to do. So I bought a mountain bike, and like, well, you need a helmet too. And I'm like, okay. I didn't even care how dorky it made me look or anything like that. And I just strapped on the helmet because everybody else was doing it, and it was what you did. And we began to ride, and over a couple of months, I began to get better and more technical, and some of these riders were, that I was riding with were pushing me. And, and a few months later, I'm riding on an old logging road, which were my favorite roads to ride. We climb up, do a hard climb, and then you get to the top, and you just get a, go as fast as you can down these old logging roads that are closed down. And when they close down logging roads, they'll, they'll dig out the culverts so they can use them somewhere else and make sure that it doesn't road, erode away. And what's so fun is you'll, you'll come flying down super fast, and then you'll have the dig out where they dug out the old culverts. And it's, woo, you get some air, and you jump, and... Sure enough, I'm heading down this mountain faster than probably my skill lever could handle, and, and I'm a, I've got a little bit more momentum behind me than I did when I was a kid, and I'm flying probably 35, 40 miles an hour down this road, and I hit one of these dugouts. And somehow in the middle of the air, me and my bike chose to go in different directions. And I'm flying through the air. Have you ever been like running? It feels like a split second. But in the air, it feels like this is 37 minutes. I'm Superman, right? You're just flying through the air. And next thing I know, I boom, I crash. And I hit the ground. And I'm a little shaken, but I realize, okay, I'm okay. And I, and I get up and I feel that my, my helmet's a little messed up. And I had split my bike helmet right in half. I was really grateful for that helmet that day. I probably wouldn't be standing here today without it. But what did I do? I took that helmet and kind of still put it on and rode the rest of the way down. And I went to the bike store and I said, oh, dude, I broke my bike helmet. I need a new one. 
and gave them 40 bucks and they gave them a new money. You know what I did? That next weekend, I went and rode. And over my mountain bike days, I broke three helmets. And every time, they're like, oh, glad I had it. And I'd go buy a new one. And in the Christian life, what Jesus is calling, to, calling us to is he's calling us to be people who put on the helmet of salvation. And the helmet is designed to protect us. The helmet is designed to take the blow in our place. And many of us, I think if we really look at our lives, we would think about the things we once did when we were young and, and had all kinds of faith. And we would like, oh, I'm going to go trust the Lord. And we'd hit and crash. And life wouldn't go the way we thought it was going to be. God didn't show up the way we thought he was going to show up. Maybe we stepped out in faith and, boy, that marriage didn't work out. Our kids are prodigals and not living the way that we thought. And before we know it, our helmets got beat up and it's broken. And versus just strapping on a new one, we go and we put it on the shelf and be like, I got to play it safe now. I got to play it safe because if I keep breaking these helmets, eventually something really bad's going to happen to me. But this same church, the church in Ephesus, probably 30 years later, after Paul's writing, John writes in the book of Revelation as Jesus is speaking in Revelation chapter 2 to the church in Ephesus. He says, guys, you're good. You've had good theology. You've held on to good teaching. But he says this to the same church. He says, yet I hold this against you, Revelation 4.2. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place. For many of us, we've hit some bumps and bruises. We've had some crashes. And we've forgotten to do the things we did at first. And because life hasn't gone the way we thought, because we didn't think God didn't come through the way we thought he was going to come through, we've hung up our helmet and we've played it safe. We've hung up our helmets and we've played it safe. When I was in high school, we moved from, from Colorado, beautiful place, to Iowa, a not so beautiful place. And Iowa's flat, man. Corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans. That's what it is for miles. And a mountain kid, like, we got to have some fun. And so me and my friend Pat, in the winter, he was kind of adventurous like me, and he had a Jeep. And we figured out that we could have fun in the winter by, he had a Jeep, I had a sled, and he had a, a water ski tow rope. And so we figured out if we put that tow rope on the back of his Jeep and sat on a sled and went down dirt roads, we could just have a grand old time. So the first time we did it, we, I was sitting out on the sled, holding onto this thing, and I'm like, go, oh, Pat, make it happen. And you, you hit about 25 miles an hour, and the snow would be flying in your face. You're like, slow down, I can't see anything. And we had a grand old time. Never did we think, like, if the Jeep stopped, the sled wouldn't stop. We didn't have those thoughts, right? Don't do this, kids. This is not an example. This is an example of not to do. But the next time we went out, we were in Pat's garage before we were heading out, and Pat's dad rode my motorcycles, and he had this sweet motorcycle helmet, and Pat go, Man, if we grab that helmet, I bet you we could go faster. And so I can vividly remember sitting on this sled in the middle of this dirt road, and I had a helmet on holding on to this ski rope, and I'm like, go! And the indicator would go like this if we wanted to go faster. And somewhere on video, praise the Lord, YouTube wasn't invented yet, there's a video of me going 62 miles an hour dragged behind a Jeep. I felt invincible. I mean, if I would have crashed, all my arms and legs would have been broken. My head probably would have been fine. But my arms and legs would have been broken. It would have been bad news. But there's a spiritual principle here. When I was a kid and I had a helmet on, I felt invincible. And you and I, when we were early in our faith, when God told us to do something... We strapped it up and we felt invincible. We said, if God is for us, who can be against us? Let's go 62 miles an hour. Let's sell the farm. Let's make things happen. Let's be obedient to God. Let's do whatever he asks. But life happens. And we get some bumps and bruises. 
and we put our helmet to the side and we say, I got to play it safe. I got to play it safe. If we could understand that God has given us this gift, this isn't our helmet. It is his helmet. He's won it. He's gifted it to us. His armor is something he's given us. Because this, because God is the divine warrior. If you're taking notes, God is the divine warrior and he has won the battle for us. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. When Jesus went to the cross and died in our place and three days later rose again, he defeated the enemy. The, the war has been won, but we're living in a time and a place where we're waiting for Jesus to come back and ultimately make all things right. But in the meantime, there are some skirmishes and some little battles that happen. And they're real, and the enemy wants to destroy our souls. And God said, here's some armor, here's some techniques on how you can live in a world that's trying to destroy you. God has won the armor for us. We don't have to fight this battle for ourselves. God has fought it for us. We have to remember that Jesus has already won the war. This week I was reading an amazing article about a Japanese soldier. His name was Hiro Ando. And he was commissioned in 1944, right before the end of the war, when the Japanese surrendered in 1945, to an island in the Philippines. And his last orders that were given to his command, from his commanding officer to him and three other soldiers were to go conduct guerrilla warfare. And different than other soldiers, they said, under no circumstances are you to surrender or take your own life. You're supposed to just wreak havoc and make it difficult, burn supplies, uh, whatever you can do to wreak havoc on the people so the allied soldiers will come. And year after year after year, he went and he did battle and the war ended in 1945 and the Japanese surrendered, but yet this man still fought in the jungle and the village people would be like, you got to do something. This guy comes down and burns our crops and raids us and all these challenging things. And the, the Japanese government flew over and dropped pamphlets and said, hey, the war's over. Japan surrendered. And he, as he recounts later in his life, here, this great soldier, he would said, it was all propaganda. I couldn't believe it. And then years later, he was still out in the jungle and those other soldiers who were with him had abandoned him or died. And the Japanese government flew over with, with pamphlets, with orders from the emperor and letters and pictures of his family saying, hey dude, the war's over, you can surrender, you can come out. Because every time they'd go and find him, he'd disappear. And he'd say, no man, that's, that's all propaganda, they're trying to trick me. And eventually a young Japanese man found him in the early 70s. And after 29 years in the jungle, after the war had been over, he said, the only way I'll surrender is if my commanding officer comes and tells me that the orders he gave me have been complete. So the Japanese government finds this soldier's commanding officer who owns a bookstore 29 years later. They fly him to the jungle of the Philippines and they make him way up into the jungle and they meet him with a direct order from the emperor. He says, we've surrendered. The war is over. Your job is complete. You can come out. And after 29 years, he finally surrenders and comes out of the jungle. And why do I tell you that story? Because human beings can be downright stubborn people. Can you imagine that? 29 years. He wouldn't believe any of the information. He wouldn't believe the truth. He wouldn't believe any of the things that people told him because there is something in us where we want to do it our way. We don't want to surrender. We want to do it our way, on our terms, the way that we see fit. And when it comes to our spiritual lives and receiving the gift of salvation, we want it our way and not God's way. A.W. Tozer, the great author and theologian, he writes this. If man had its way, the plan of redemption would be an endless and bloody conflict. In reality, salvation was bought not with Jesus' fist, but with his nail-pierced hands. Not by muscles, but by love. Not by vengeance, but by forgiveness. Not by force, but by sacrifice. Jesus Christ, our Lord, surrendered in order that he might win. He destroyed his enemies 
by dying for them and conquering death by allowing death to conquer him. And the helmet of salvation is God's gift to us that he wants to give us to set us free. And it's not something that we can earn. If we had it our way, we want to do it on our terms. We wouldn't surrender until we got what we want. And so many of us in our thinking, we can't embrace new information. We can't embrace the truth of the gospel because we're just stuck in our thinking. The culture, the water in which we live has so affected our thinking and our ability to see the truth of God that we can't make sense of the gospel message of a God who loves us and requires only that we surrender. And so many of us, we've allowed the enemy to get into our head. And so we're called, we, we can't let the enemy get in your head. Don't let the enemy get in your head if you're taking notes. And here's three ways that the enemy gets into our head. The first one is this is he justifies or rationalizes our sin. We justify or we rationalize our sin. We say, ah, it's not that bad. You know, I'm living this way. It's better than the people around me. We justify and we rationalize and we say, well, hey, you know what? We're going to get married anyway, so it's okay to live together. And I just love him so much. He loves me. Her, I love her so much that it's okay. And we, we, we sell short the sin that invades our lives. And we think that it's not bad because compared to the culture around us, we think, hey, we're doing okay. We justify so many things. Oh, we don't have the money to, for a wedding, so we'll just live together. And it leaves us in a place that's so far from the freedom that God wants for us. Second thing is we take out, we, we, God, the enemy takes us out of taking risks for God. I know this one is that I deal with. I've had this thought many a time when I'm at the, at the cusp of making an obedient decision to follow God. I'll hear the enemy in my mind say, hey, Tim, you took a risk for God 10 years ago. You're good. It's somebody else's turn. Tim, you know what? You have too much to risk now. This is what I deal with as I've grown and matured and I like, have a retirement account and I've got kids I've got to take care of. I think, Tim, you, 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 can't, you can't be risky like that because you have too much to risk. You can't be obedient. The consequences are too high. And it sells short the obedience in which God has called me to live. And it's me not putting on my helmet of salvation, thinking, remembering that I'm invincible because God is for me. Who can be against me? And the third one where, where the enemy can get in our heads is this, is friendly fire. Christians are really bad at this. Sometimes we eat our own. Christians are imperfect people and we can hurt each other. Sometimes our expectations, we think like, oh, they're a Christian, that means that they should be good. No, they're a sinner like everybody else. And so part of it, you have to kind of manage your expectations and realize that we're all sinner, broken people. We're trying to pursue and find and be like Jesus, but we're imperfect and we don't have it all figured out. And I think some of us, we find ourselves just like this. Can we show that, that, that uh, video of Joey? This is a, a viral video that uh, went, went really viral last year, and it's of Joey getting his head stuck. And what a wonderful mom sees his son stuck in the banister and says, oh, I need to get my camera and take video of this versus help him out. And Joey's sitting there and he's saying, I'm stuck, I can't get out. The kid remains amazingly calm. It's like four minutes long. And then dad shows up and says, all right, let's just try to brute force this thing out. And the kid's like, my ears, my ears, dad, stop, stop. And then the dad says, I guess we'll just have to get some butter. We're going to butter him up and get his heads out. And then, and then you'll see him, he tries brute force in just a moment. And I think many of us, this is how we feel. We feel like our heads are stuck. We're stuck in life and we're trying techniques and we're trying anything we can to move forward and to change it. The dog's even trying to help there, right? Everybody's like, oh, oh, Joey, I'm sorry, you're stuck. And we find ourselves just in this weak and vulnerable position where we're stuck. Where we're stuck. Our thinking has been tainted. God, when he made us, he made us with these amazing brains. Have you ever had this thought that you can have a thought so deep that it blows your own brain? Whoa! 
whoa, like, what do you do that? God created us with the image of God, the ability to create ideas and dreams and amazing things in between our ears. Our minds are so powerful and amazing that God has created us, but they can also get the best of us. And our minds without the helmet of salvation, the enemy can get in our heads and taint our thinking and we can begin to believe alternate realities and we can't embrace the truth of Jesus and we find ourselves merely stuck between the gospel and culture. And Jesus wants to give us another way. And here's what the Gospels, God knew this. And so in the scriptures, he gave us an idea. And here's what it is. It's called renew your mind. And we're just going to read four scriptures. This is a four of many, many scriptures about how God understood that you and I, we need to be intentional and purposeful with our minds. We need to put on the helmet of salvation. Romans 2, 4. Don't conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Some of you think, I can't hear from God. You know why you can't hear from God? Because you're living in the patterns of this world. And so you can't even hear God's will for your life. You can't hear what his good, pleasing, and perfect will is for your life because you're not living a transformed life. You're living in the patterns of this world. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Does that sound passive? It's active. We have the ability to say, man, I am not going to let my mind run wild. For, for three months this fall, I did an experiment, and I didn't watch any news. I didn't open up any news apps on my phone, and life was pretty awesome. <laughs> and then after three months, I said, okay, I better find out what's going on in the world. And I started scrolling through the news app, and I was like, this is why everybody in our church is freaking out. Everybody's dying. Everybody's trying to kill you. The world's falling apart and the life is deteriorating around us. And that is in direct opposition to the gospel message of Jesus that says the kingdom of God is moving forward and the gates of hell will not prevail it. But I don't know if you believe it. The world and the culture around you has you convinced that you're losing. But God is winning. The kingdom of God is coming in its fullness. And we're part of the winning team. We don't have to fear. We can put on the helmet of salvation and say, I'm invincible. That's what God needs is a group of people, a church, who are not intimidated and scared by the world around us but are motivated by the hope and love of Jesus Christ that dwells within us, that will overcome greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Philippians 4.8, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think that would change your day? Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Proverbs 23, 7. As someone thinks within himself, so he is. We need to renew our minds. And Jesus will set us free. I don't want to leave Joey stuck. Here's the back half of that video with Joey. There's audio on this part. Listen very carefully. I wonder if today the Lord would look at many of us and we need to have a yay, I got out moment. Because you're stuck. You're stuck between your ears. Your, your thinking has led you to a place where it's hard for you to trust God. You've forgotten to do the things you did at first. And off that video, mom gave Joey a little coaching after watching it and figuring it out like, oh, this is how we get out of this. And if we just keep trying to do the same thing over and over and over again, we're going to rip our ears off. We're never going to get out. And the good news is God has a plan 
to get us out of the mess we're in. God has a plan to redeem and restore us, to transform us by the renewing of our mind so that we can put on the helmet of salvation so we don't get stuck in this battle between culture and the gospel. God wants to set us free. And we're going to end here in just a moment. I'm going to ask that we would kind of be in an attitude of prayer. And there's just two things I want us to consider. The first one is this. If you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, where have you stopped taking risks? Where because you got beat up, your helmet protected you a couple of times in the midst of challenging, difficult life things, you chose to hang up your helmet. And the Lord has been stirring my heart these last weeks. Saying, Tim, hello, answer the phone. <laughs> but saying, hey, this, where, where do you got to risk it again, Tim? Where do you got to do the things you did at first? And then secondly, I think we really have to ask ourselves this question. Have we experienced the salvation power of Jesus? For some of us, we've heard a lot about the good news of God. We've heard a lot about the gospel. But we haven't believed it and we haven't come out of the jungle and surrendered. We want it on our terms. We want it in a way that makes sense to us. We want it to be, fits in our pretty little box and the gospel is not about you. The gospel is about Jesus and it's about what he's done for you. And so I'm just going to ask that we just kind of be still for a moment before the Lord and let him speak to us. Lord, I, I, um, I, I just want to repent, God. Where, where my head, my, Lord, I got hurt. I got some things and I stopped risking. Lord, would you lead our church? Would you lead us to be obedient, to risk it all, to never play it safe? Lord, would you stir the hearts of individuals right now where we, we've, we've, we've hung the helmet <clears throat> on the shelf and said, I can't do that anymore. And Lord, I never want you to have to write to the church of Stanwood and said, that this I hold against you. You have forsaken your first love and you've forgotten to do the things you did at first. Lord, stir us up to action. Stir us up to faith. Stir us up to dream bigger than we could ever imagine. And then Lord, in this room, I know that there's some of us that today's the day of salvation. God, you're speaking, the Holy Spirit is just speaking to your heart right now and you're wondering what's going on. Your chest is beating and you're breathing hard. You're like, what's going on? It is God's Spirit speaking to you right now. And he's calling you to surrender. You've been trying to do it your way. You've, the pamphlets have been dropped. The good news of Jesus has been sent out. And you're like, no, I'm not going to surrender until it all makes sense to me. And the God who loves you so dearly is saying, surrender. And he wants to give you a free gift and he wants to set you free. He wants to get you out of that stuck place where you're in and save you from the mess that you find yourself in today. He wants to transform your thinking and transform your life. If that's you today, I just want to be, I want to ask you to be so bold, not to, for me, but to agree with you and to seal what God's doing in your heart. If that's you, you say, man, today's the day of salvation for me. I want to surrender and I want to believe in Jesus. Would you look up at me? Would you wave your hand at me? My right, your left? Anybody? Yes, yeah, sir, I think, I see you. Thank you. Yeah, I see you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, God, for what you're doing in the middle section. Yes, ma'am, I see you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I see what God's doing. Yeah, Lord, my right, your left. 
Lord, we thank you for the eight people who just say yes to you. Lord, would this be a new day of transformation in their life? And Lord, would this be a journey of saying repentance? And Lord, now would they begin to move in a new direction? Would you guard our heads with the helmet of salvation to get our thinking right? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we applaud those who say yes to Jesus today? Awesome. <clears throat>